Fucking god damn. <sighs> fucking started the video and the moment I hit fucking record I banged the shit out of my knee on the fucking desk. Ow. Okay. Hey healthy addict. I'm bound to tell. And this isn't so much a video response to the main content of your video and that this is really isn't about sexism, but it's about some inaccuracies in both uh you know, the way that you and Coughlin characterize uh, chivalry historically. You're actually both right, because chivalry evolved and changed over time. Now, chivalry uh, is the institution of knighthood in the medieval uh, time period. That's what it means uh, historically. Um, unless you specifically point out that you're not talking about that aspect of chivalry, and you're talking about its cultural adopt, uh, adoption and adaptations, you know, once it gets in, uh, once it's no longer just a thing for knights or anything like that. So, um, it, it, it is a code of conduct that was born out of the Crusades. Um, and as such, it's, uh, it's a code of conduct and behavior and honor um, for Christian knights is really what it started out as. It started out as codes of valor and uh, how to have honor and mercy in battle and things like this. And, um, and didn't really include so much of the courtly love stuff at first because originally the code of chivalry was just adopted when you took your vow for the crusade to be a knight for the crusade and went out and did it. And that only lasted for so long. Um, but built out of this and after the, some of the success of the crusades, you know, you have a need for a standing army, especially when you're starting to go and invade people from all over the world. You need to defend yourself after that point, after you piss them off. So they start creating standing armies through the creation of a lot of knightly orders, which then start making a lot of these codes more official and more laid out. And uh, this is when they start to develop and go into different directions, really. Um, and this is when chivalry starts to evolve. But at this point, it's still very much a religious and militaristic code. Um, it is all about uh, protecting those who are weaker than you, and one a huge aspect of it is sacrificing your life for another's life, regardless of whether they're your lord or they're poor or anything like that, regardless of their qualities, you know, their characteristics. Sacrificing your life for another person is was a huge part of it, um, and and things uh, and virtues such as valor and honor and uh, justice you know, were very important. For instance, one of the ways that they would actually carry out justice would be through trial by ordeal, which is trial through essentially crazy-ass circumstances that are really difficult to get through. Now, the way that this happened in chivalry is that, or at least one of the ways it happened in chivalry, um, is that you'd have a duel between two knights, and the idea was that God would choose the winner, and Whoever won that duel didn't win it just because they happen to have martial prowess. It's because God looked down and said, okay, in this trial, this is the person who's right, and gave them the ability to win, uh, and decided it that way. So, you know, and this certainly does in involve some aspects of courtly love, especially when you start getting into some trials by ordeal. Because a few examples I can think of off the top of my head or can at least remember from medieval literature do involve trial by ordeal based around uh, the honor of a lady. Now, over time, these ideals certainly fade. And as with many systems of uh, honor and law or anything like that, it becomes bogged down into supporting itself rather than supporting its ideas. Um, and as this happens, a lot of the, the, the knightly orders start to lose a lot of their usefulness um, as you get closer and closer to the Renaissance and you get closer and closer to the modern day. Um, and so they begin to lose, like I said, a lot of their usefulness, a lot of their practicality, and they start to become far more institutions of what's going to be the aristocracy after medieval feudalism. And this is really when the idea of courtly love or benevolent sexism, as we're now uh, pointing it out to be, starts to come into play with chivalry. 
And this is greatly enhanced by the fact that uh, wealthy merchants started to adopt a lot of the codes of honor of knights, um, but obviously not the more militaristic ones, because they're merchants. So they start to adopt uh, some of the virtues, especially the courtly love. Um, and it sort of starts to set the tone for how the aristocracy is going to go uh, throughout the Renaissance and Enlightenment, so on and so forth. So the point is that chivalry wasn't historically always about benevolent sexism. In fact, for most of chivalry's history, it was about militaristic religion. Um, but it eventually became integrated into culture as the knightly orders fell apart and eventually did become more and more uh, about courtly love and more and more an expression of benevolent sexism. So you're both right, I, I would say, and that Coughlin pointed out something right and that you pointed out something right, but you guys are talking about two different time periods when you're referring to uh, chivalry in its historical context. So I figured I'd share what I've learned about chivalry because I'm a huge nerd, so I've played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, and I do a lot of historical research so I can make my characters, you know, awesome like that, especially since I do a lot of writing in my spare time anyway. I like to know that kind of stuff so I can write stories perhaps about things like chivalry. And I also did a lengthy research paper about medieval heraldry, of which chivalry is very much tied to, uh, because it's all about knights. So I learned about a decent bit about it back then, so it's been a subject I've been very interested in for a while, so I figured I'd just chip in and offer what I know, I guess. Okay, so I hope you enjoy whatever the fuck you're going to do after this video.